All right, welcome everybody to the uh, last part of the introduction of Critique of Pure Reason that we will be studying in this comprehensive yet pretty informal Critique of Pure Reason study. Um, so this section is called The Idea and Division of a Special Science under the name of a Critique of Pure Reason. So basically just how Kant is dividing uh, the sections of Critique of Pure Reason, you know, under the special science that he has created, um, and sort of just the greater idea of it and the specific ideas which are being divided up in, in a special way. It's basically what we're going over, pretty just logistical section of the text, unlike last section, which was full of, like, content and themes of this work. Now we're going to be getting more into just the nitty-gritty details um, in terms of just their, like, titles, definitions. Um, so maybe not the most fun, but um, definitely essential for understanding the vocabulary going to be used on and later on in the text. And, uh, yeah, I don't think much else more to say. It's just going to be me today, but um, that's fine, especially, like I said, since this is more of a logistical thing anyway. So now, without any further ado, we'll get started. We can get started here. <clears throat> All right says, now, from all of this, there results the idea of a special science which can be called the critique of pure reason. For reason is the faculty that provides the principles of cognition a priori. Hence, pure reason is that which contains the principles for cognizing something absolutely a priori. An organon of pure reason would be a sum total of all those principles in accordance with which all pure a priori cognitions can be acquired and actually be brought about. The exhaustive application of such an organon would create a system of pure reason. But since that requires yes, but since that requires a lot and is still open it is still an open question whether such an amplification of our knowledge is possible at all and in what cases it would be possible, we can regard a science of the mere estimation of pure reason of its sources and boundaries as the propedeutic to the system of pure reason. Propedeutic Propedeutic? Not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, long P word. But uh, such a thing would not be a doctrine, but must be called only a critique of pure reason, and its utility in regard to speculation would really be only negative, serving not for the amplification, but only the purification of our reason, and for keeping it free of errors by which a great deal is already won. I call a cognition transcendental that is occupied not so much with objects, but rather our mode of cognition of objects insofar as this is to be possible a priori. A system of such concepts would be called a transcendental philosophy. But this is, again, too much for the beginning. For since such a science would have to contain completely both the analytic as well as the synthetic a priori cognition, it is, so far as our aim is concerned, too broad in scope since we would need to take the analysis only as far as is indispensably necessary in order to provide insight into the principles of a, a priori synthesis in their entire scope, which is only our concern. Um, so last time when I did this on my own, I kind of went through the whole, however many things were going, I kind of went back and explained, but I think it might just be easier natural flow to have doing it with Patrick, where I just kind of break it down, um, sort of just as we go along naturally. Um, so just kind of summing up this first page here, right? The critique of pure reason, the beginning term, it's the it's the special science that essentially what we're doing, right? We're investigating uh, the faculty that provides the principles of cognition a priori, right? The, the a priori, uh, if you recall, you know, being the necessary uh, cognition. And it's, so we're kind of investigating the faculty behind that. Uh, and then an organon, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, it's the sum total of all the principles uh, that basically allow the prior cognitions to be acquired and, you know, uh, implemented. Uh, it's a bit abstract language now, um, but once this is applied, uh, you will see how it fits in. Um, I'm going to get to the transcendental aesthetic next time. Uh, so the 
propaedeutic. I think that's how you say that. <laughs> um, that is... Oh, okay. So that's sort of that's sort of saying that's sort of like drawing the limits. I think is what that's saying. Yeah, sort of questioning the possibility of knowledge. Um, so I guess the organon is more like just investing in those principles, and the propaedeutic would be the next step up. I mean, like, okay, what are the limits of these principles? What do they allow us to know uh, for Kant? Keep in mind that limiting uh, knowledge in the sense that he means it of like, you know, there being a reality out there and us only being able to cognize a certain amount of it and other aspects of it being unknown. That's, uh, I don't want to say exclusive to Kant, but that's that's what he means by like, uh, it's sources and boundaries, it's like the boundaries especially. He, he thinks that's an important thing to set up and so he uses this word propedeutic to to get that across um, and then he says this isn't a doctrine but it's only a critique uh, its utility in regard to speculation would really only be negative certainly not for the amplification but only for the purification of our reason okay so it's not really like amplifying right it's uh, I guess it's, he's taking doctrine to mean like something that is is positive rather rather than negative this critique he's saying is negative he's sort of he's sort of really just purifying keeping it, he's sort of negating the errors from from reason rather than putting forth new um i don't say new ideas because kant really does put forth some revolutionary new ideas some of which we've already seen in previous sections especially like the last section was really great but um in Kant's eyes, I guess what he's doing in this critique rather than doctrine of pure reason is really limiting knowledge um, to a, to its proper to to what it properly is limited to <laughs> um, in Kant's eyes, and just keeping it free of error. Um, and then the system of uh, so transcend so all kind of transcendental. So for some reason, only transcendental philosophy is bolded in. Uh, let me see if I can get my mouth. Yeah, transcendental. I, f I feel like this should be bolded here. I'm not sure why it's not. This is definitely an important word. Honestly, I'd argue more important than most, if not all, of these previous bolded words um, that we've covered so far. So transcendental is occupied not so much with objects, but rather the mode of cognition insofar as they possibly a priori. And remember, this is brand new, like transcendental. Um, and then the system of those concepts being the transcendental philosophy. This is something totally new on the scene in the history of Western philosophy. And if you're a newcomer to philosophy, probably totally new to you. I remember for me, this uh, it's like blew my mind, right? It's like, no longer are we just doing metaphysics in the sense of like, what is real, uh, or philosophy in general, right? And it's like, we're not really like epistemology too. We're not just considering it as like totally divided, like subject and object, but rather we're, we're combining that to talk about uh, what objects like are, how, how we cognize, how it's possible to cognize objects a priori, like necessary, the, the necessary uh, cognition of objects. That's just something totally new and, and huge that Kant brings to the table. And if you want to know why that's so huge, I definitely encourage you, if you don't know already or if you forgot or something from our previous sections, definitely go back to those and check it out. And we're going to see it more in the coming sections as well. So this is huge. Um, and then he just says too much from the beginning. Uh, to broaden scope. Yeah, so this is uh, pretty much the end of the definitions for this page, and then he's going to talk about the investigation on the next page. So he says, this investigation, which we can properly call not doctrine, but only transcendental critique, since it does not aim at the amplification of cognitions themselves, but only at their correction. Uh, this is basically repeating what he said before. And is to supply their touchstone of the worth or worthlessness of cognitions a priori. Is that with which we are now concerned? Such a critique is accordingly a preparation, if possible, for an organon, and if this cannot be accomplished, then at least for a canon, 
in accordance with which the complete system of philosophy of pure reason, whether it is to consist in the amplification or mere limitation of its cognition, can in any case at least someday be exhibited both analytically and synthetically. For that, this should be possible, indeed, that such a system should not be too great in scope for us to hope to be able to entirely to complete it, can be assessed in advance from the fact that our object is not the nature of things, which is inexhaustible, but the understanding, which judges about the nature of things, and this in turn only in regard to its a priori cognition, the supply of which, since we do not need to search for it externally, cannot remain hidden from us, and in all likelihood is small enough to be completely recorded, its, worthless, its worth or worthlessness assessed, and subject to a correct appraisal. Um, so that's a pretty big chunk. Let's try to break that down. So he starts out with his repeating saying, you know, it's a critique, guys. We're not really aiming to add anything here. We really just want to start off at the very least with correcting uh, and judge the worth or worthlessness of cognitions a priori. And this is a mission he's picking up uh, from David Hume. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, others, but particularly David Hume was concerned very much with the worth, worth or worthlessness of um, both uh, facts uh, and what, what were his terms? Were they collection of facts and um, associations of ideas? Something like that. Uh, I'm not a Hume scholar by any means, if you couldn't tell. Um, and Patrick, who's here with me, knows uh, a bit more off the top of his head, at least, uh, of Hume. But, uh, but regardless of what the exact words were, this is still something that Hume was looking to do. He was trying to judge the worth of cognitions. I mean, his was a bit larger scope, just sort of all our cognitions. Um, and sort of all of experience, Hume was trying to... Or no, he all, yeah, really, Hume was really trying to judge the worth and worthlessness of ideas. And this is, you know, something huge before we were talking about cause and effect for the last few sections, because that's one of the hugest problems that Hume kind of exposed and Kant is looking to repair uh with this with this work um uh the, you know he said any anything that you know doesn't have a sense impression or can't be like mathematically judged or uh, that's not exactly it word for word but that's that's the core concept of these is committed to the flames right it's worthless which includes like natural science and theology and all these important sciences that humanity and philosophy for a large part held valuable uh, so that's sort of a bit of the stakes of, of what he's, he means by that. And I went into that more last time. So check in, uh, we did, you know, Patrick and I and a few others in the previous section. So be sure to go back and check that out if you want to hear more about that. But that's essentially what Kant's trying to do. He's trying to not, he's trying to do clear of errors and judge the worth and worthlessness of those cognitions, some of which are very important, as I was just saying. Uh, so then he says, such a critique is accordingly a preparation, if possible, for an order. Uh, so this sort of prepares, and if we right, go back just to the last time in Oregon, uh, it's the principles uh, by which basically a priori, a priori cognitions are brought about and are acquired. Uh, so doing this will allow us to uh, develop principles by which we can come up with these, a hopefully, you know, uh, valuable and, and uh, of worth uh, cognitions. Um, and if uh, and if it cannot that cannot be accomplished, at least it'll be canon in accordance. Uh, so even if we can't come up with a whole a whole list of principles, at least we'll have the basic idea uh, of how a philosophy of pure reason would 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 work essentially. Um, whether it is to consist in the amplification or limitation. So whether no matter really what it's doing, at least we'll be able to understand it. Um, and it should be able to be exhibited analytically and synthetically. Um, I don't exactly know what he means by this, uh, because as we've seen analytic and synthetic, I guess in theor theoretically you could go about, uh, deriving a judgment either analytically or synthetically, depending on what it is. I can't come up with examples in my head, but he he thinks that the complete system of pure reason could at least be derived analytically and synthetically. Um, oh, unless he doesn't, unless he means like using both of them together. That would make a lot more sense. 
than doing them like than, than doing the same thing twice, except just using one way the you know one time doing analytic and the other synthetic. So maybe I'm just reading into that wrong. Maybe it just means using both analytic and synthetic judgments come up with a complete system of philosophy. That would seem a lot more in, in line with what Kant ends up doing, and along with uh, it would be much more in line with what he said so far as well. Um, and if you want more in what analytic and synthetic judgments are, definitely go back and look at those. Um, for it should be possible, he says, that because it's not too great in scope for us to hope to be able to entirely complete it, it can be assessed from the fact that our object is not the nature of things, which is exhaustively understanding. So basically, uh, it's, you know, we don't have to look at every single thing. Kant's kind of, or we don't have to evaluate every single judgment, right, to come up with a whole system of philosophy. We just have to investigate our own uh, faculty of understanding. Um, and this goes back to, you know, this is, this is sort of something that defines, I think, uh, the the modern the, the tradition of modern philosophy where it's not really you're not really going around looking and pointing and investigating individual things rather you're sort of coming up with the general methodology by which you can evaluate uh, claims philosophically uh, started with Descartes right his method of doubt um, David Hume we were talking about before right David Hume's Criterion of Truth when we were talking about this up here was how to judge the worth or worthlessness of cognitions. Uh, you know, for him, you, his method is, you know, connected to a sense impression or do it with a reliable association of ideas like uh, mathematics. And if you can't do that, nope, worthless. That's Hume's criterion. And Kant is also uh, trying to come up here with a criterion. Um, using this uh, uh, critique of pure reason and judging a priori uh, cognitions uh, we should be able to do this by, you know, investigating the understanding is what he's saying there, from what I understand. Uh, so, where did I leave off? <laughs> Lost it. Uh, oh, and he thinks this, this faculty is just, you know, since we're just investing in the understanding, he says that's small enough. To be completely recorded, it's worth or worthless assessed, right? That's the criteria on there, and subject to a correct appraisal. Uh, so yeah, he's pretty confident in his ability to do this. A lot of philosophers um, are are not so so sure. Uh, at least for me, like Wittgenstein comes to mind, right? When it comes to very limited ability, right? You know, language and and thought have very limited capacities to get you know meaning across um, i'm no wittgenstein expert but like just that at least that sort of language is is what i think he's kind of talking about here but he thinks that you know that's and he's he felt that at least he felt that he had a um a solid enough grasp of the faculty of understanding to uh carry out this critique of pure reason so that being said uh even less can Sorry. Even less can one expect here a critique of the books and systems of pure reason, but rather that of the pure faculty of reason itself. Only if this is one's ground as one of a secure touchstone for appraising the philosophical content of all the new works in the specialty. Otherwise, the unqualified historian and judge assess the groundless assertions of others through his own, which are equally groundless. So yeah, he's basically saying only if we... Only if the grounds are secure, right, for appraising content, philosophical content, uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to do anything. So that's pretty straightforward. Anything reliably and correctly, at least. So then he goes on, next paragraph down here, and he says, Transcendental philosophy is here the idea of a science, for which the critique of pure reason is to outline the entire plan architect architectonically. That is, from principles, with a full guarantee for the completeness and certainty of all the components that compromise this edifice. It is the system of all principles of pure reason that this critique is not itself already called transcendental philosophy. Transcendental philosophy rests solely on the fact that in order to be a complete system, it would also have to contain an exhaustive analysis of all human cognition a priori. Now our critique must, to be sure, lay before us a complete enumeration of all ancestral concepts that compromise the cognition in question. Only it properly refrains from the exhaustive analysis of these concepts themselves as well as from the complete review of all is derived from them, partly because this analysis would not be pur purposeful since it does not contain the difficulty encountered in the synthesis on account of which the whole critique is actually undertaken, partly because it 
would be contrary to the unity of the plan to take on responsibility for the completeness of such an analysis and derivation from which one could yet be relieved given its aim. This, this completeness of the analysis as well as the derivation of from the a priori concepts that are to be provided in the future will nevertheless... Oh, I forgot to change the page on here. We are... Right here. So it says, this completeness of the analysis as well as the derivation from the a priori concepts that are to be provided in the future will nevertheless be easy to complete as long as they are present as exhaustive principles of synthesis and if nothing is lacking in them in regard to this essential aim. So, what he is saying here. This is country. So essentially he's saying we just need to look at the exhaustive principles of synthesis and make sure we have all of them. Otherwise, this uh, this goal that we have is going to be incomplete. We need to make sure. So even though Kant, before he was saying, right, the understanding uh, should be pretty easy. And even here he's saying, uh, you know, it, it will nevertheless be easy to complete as long as they're present. So as long as we really derive the a priori concepts from legitimate, like, synthetic judgments, uh, it should be fine. And to see why I'm so confident in that, you know, you can go back and look at synthetic uh, a priori um, and then see how highly in esteem Khan holds those judgments. And once you understand that, it makes sense why he's calling this, you know, such an easy thing to do. Uh, and thus, you know, we'll, we will fulfill uh, the aim. And we'll have everything essential to it. And then he goes on to say, to, to the critique of pure reason, there accordingly belongs everything that constitutes transcendental philosophy. And it is the complete idea of transcendental philosophy, but it is not yet the science itself, since it goes only so far in the analysis as is requisite for the complete estimation of synthetic a priori cognition. The chief target in the division of, a, of such a science, that is that absolutely no concept, is that absolutely no concept, must enter into it, that contains anything empirical, or that the a priori cognition be entirely pure. Hence, although the supreme principles of morality and the fundamental concepts of it are a priori cognitions, they still do not belong in transcendental philosophy. For while they do not, to be sure, take the concepts of pleasure and displeasure, of desires, inclinations, etc., which are all of empirical origin as the grounds of their precepts, they, must, they still must necessarily include in them the composition of the system of pure morality and the concept of duty as the hindrance that must be overcome or the attraction that ought not to be made into a motive. Hence, transcendental philosophy is a philosophy of pure, merely speculative reason. For everything practical, insofar as it contains incentives, as it is related to feelings, which belong among empirical sources of cognition. So basically, Kant's just fit in this big paragraph here, which we just went over. He's basically just saying that, uh, transcendental philosophy is really only dealing with the most pure speculative reason. Even things that are a priori, uh, even for him, you know, uh, he is his big belief in the uh, um, a priori morality and and practical reason. Which after this, he uh, released a critique of practical reason, dealing with morality, most of which are based on a priori principles. Uh, for Kant. Um, and some of which aren't even empirical. But even that doesn't really matter um, for what constitutes a transcendental philosophy. What really is just going on here is investigating reason and its underlying sources, its uh, origins, it's, as we were saying before, too, it's limitations for Kant, and it's uh, freeing it from errors. That's really what it's doing. It's really just investigating reason uh, as purely and speculatively as possible, not bringing in even just other a priori cognitions, which already kind of assume reason, I guess would be the, the right phrase there, which kind of just take it as it is and just makes judgments from there. 
um, that that still isn't going to work for transcendental philosophy. You're really, just going as far back and and far pure in in Kantian terms uh, as we can. Um, so that being said, now he goes on to say, now if one wants to set up the division of the science from the general viewpoint of a system in general, then what we will now present must contain must first must contain first a doctrine of elements and second a doctrine of method of pure reason. Each of these main parts will have its subdivisions, the grounds for which cannot yet be expounded. Uh, all that seems necessary for an introduction or preliminary is that there are two stems of human cognition which may perhaps arise from a common but to us unknown root in a sensibility and understanding through which the first of which objects are given to us, but through the second of which they are thought. Now, if sensibility were to contain a prior representations, which constitute the condition under which objects are given to us, it would belong to transcendental philosophy. The transcendental doctrine of the senses will have to belong to the first part of the science of elements, since the conditions under which alone the objects of human cognition are given precede those under which those objects are thought. And there we have it, the end of the introduction. And what this last little paragraph is about, uh, going back one, he's right here, he's basically just saying, we need doctrine of knowledge and doctrine of method. Um, and then he says, you know, each of these parts are going to have subdivisions, grounds for which can be expounded because it wouldn't really make a lot of sense because he's going to talk about things at the very beginning which only then will you will we be able to understand uh its subdivisions but um some of which being like on space and on time and if you don't understand like what those are for example the doctrine of elements uh, which is where we're heading next uh after this we're starting off the elements the first part of that is the transcendental aesthetic which is as on space and on time some subdivisions there uh, you know, not can't be expounded yet because it goes into those, and it only makes sense really when we get there. Um. Uh, yeah, whoops, went the wrong way. Uh, but the well, all we need to understand right now at this point, going into the transcendental doctrine of elements, uh, there and you know, therefore going into it at the beginning, uh, we're going to be going to the transcendental aesthetic. What we need to know for that is uh, sensibility and understanding. Um, uh, and these are super important concepts. We will definitely touch on these very much in the next part. But basically, to understand them at a very basic level, now he introduces them to them to uh, he introduces it right here at the end of the introduction. So sensibility is the faculty through which things are for Kant are given to us. Uh, objects are given to us, and then understanding is the faculty by which we uh, make our own cognitions. Uh, and then he says, if sensibility were to contain, so sensibility, that being, again, the faculty of receiving objects, if that were to contain a priori representations, which constitute the condition under which objects are given to us, it will belong to transcendent philosophy. Uh, so I kind of said this, we're going to talk about, I kind of spoiled it. <laughs> we're going to be talking about both of these. So that means, according to Kant's logic, they contain a prior representations, uh, which is strange, right? Because sensibility usually uh, associated with empiricism, associated with, you know, for for Kant, all, most of it is a, a posteriori objects, right? So how could something a priori be given as a representation? He's going to go into that. Uh, and, you know, also a little spoiler slash hint. Uh, uh, that's a lot, uh, on space, space and time have a big thing to do with that, uh, which is just a mind-blowing part of the uh, doctrine of elements, and, and, uh, which is the transcendental aesthetic. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll really be going into that uh, next time. I'm trying to decide if we're going to go straight into the, like, because how that transcendental aesthetic works is an introduction and then it goes into on space. So I'm wondering if we should do, we'll probably just do the introduction because it's a, it's, a, it's a lot. But yeah, so that's that. these are the faculties we need to understand. Sensibility, we take things in and understanding. Uh, we we con will, will later on say spontaneously uh, cognize concepts. So objects and concepts is basically what you can metaphysically tie to these uh, faculties, epistemological faculties. Um, 
Yeah, and we're going to be dealing with those. Uh, he says if they are, but, um, you know, like I said, it, they do. So don't worry about it. We'll be getting into that next time and a lot of other interesting things next time as we have ended the introduction and will continue into the Transcendental Dark Developments. And we will be doing the first part, Transcendental Aesthetic. So we hope, I hope, and this was a fine introduction. Uh, it was quite long. There's a little, very, it's very meaty, uh, a lot of material. And that isn't just the case with the introduction. With Kant, the, the whole book is pretty much going to have to be analyzed more or less at this level because it's there's just so much to it. But it's been fascinating so far, and this is just the introduction. So I hope you're ready to get into the rest of it. Um, transcendental dark novelements and next time specifically at the uh, transcendental aesthetic and beyond that the doctrine of method and everything that goes along with that it's going to be a great journey and i hope you're excited thank you for joining us please leave comments with any questions or just out there engagements you wish to uh leave and uh yeah we will see you or at least i will see you uh, hopefully others will join me next time but at least i will see you for the next part where we're jumping into the transcendental aesthetic. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I will uh, I'll see you then.